Are you loving it? Yeah, you know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know I'm loving it. Loving it. So if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Then put the hand up high, right where the other is. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. So if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Then put the hand up high, right where the other is. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you're loving it. And so if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. So put a hand up. Hey, this is Reese from the medical school, and today we're going to talk about acid-base disorders. We're going to break down this seemingly complex topic into simple concepts so that you'll be able to tackle any problem that comes your way. Here's the outline for today's discussion. We're going to go over a brief introduction, normal ABG values, the step-by-step -step approach to determining an acid-base disorder, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis, and respiratory alkalosis. Hopefully by the end you'll be able to figure out any acid-base disorder. Here are a few introductory points. First, acid-base disorders occur in both acute and chronic disease processes. Being able to identify an acid-base disorder will let us identify the process involved. Second, Understanding acid-base disorders is necessary in urgent situations, such as when a patient is acutely decompensating. Third, a normal pH does not exclude an acid-base disorder from being present. Two other important points. One, if you have a primary disorder that's an acidosis, then the body will tend to compensate with an alkalosis and vice versa. In addition, if a primary disorder is mainly respiratory, whether it be acidosis or alkalosis, the body will compensate with the metabolic process, either an acidosis or an alkalosis. These are the main points to remember as you understand acid-base disorders. Here are the normal values that you will see on an ABG, arterial blood gas. Arterial pH is usually 7.35 to 7.45. Serum bicarb is 24, plus or minus 2. Arterial PCO2 is 40 plus or minus 5. And arterial PO2 is usually 80 to 100. It's important to note the normal values so that you can identify abnormal values when you're trying to tackle acid base disorders. Now, let's go on to determining how to identify an acid base disorder. First, you want to look at the pH to determine if it's an acidosis or alkalosis. Second, look at the PCO2 and bicarb to determine the primary disorder. If the change in PCO2 is consistent with the change in pH, then it is a respiratory process. If the change in bicarb is consistent with the change in pH, then it is a metabolic process. Once you've identified whether it's acidotic or alkalotic, respiratory or metabolic, look to see if there's a secondary disorder, which we'll talk about towards the end of the video. Now let's tackle the metabolic acidosis. The first thing that you'll see in a metabolic acidosis is the pH is less than 7.35, indicating an acidosis. Second, that the bicarb is low. The bicarb is consistent with the acidosis, indicating this is a metabolic acidosis. The way we separate metabolic acidoses is into two categories normal anion gap and elevated anion gap or increased anion gap. The anion gap measures anions in the serum blood that are altered due to different causes of the acidosis. You calculate the anion gap by using the serum sodium and subtracting the sum of chloride plus bicarb. The normal anion gap should range from 8 to 12. But remember that a lot of patients are sick and they will not be producing albumin. So you need to correct for this. So for every unit that your albumin is less than 4, you multiply that by 2.5 and add that to the ion gap. Remember, albumin is an inverse acute phase reactant, so it decreases in acute situations. So the etiologies of an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis are described by the mnemonic mud pilers. 
This stands for 1. Methanol ingestion, 2. Uremia, 3. Diabetic ketoacidosis, 4. Peraldehyde, 5. Ischemia slash isoniazide slash iron ingestion, 5. Lactic acidosis, 6. Ethylene glycol, 7. Rhabdomyolysis, and 8. Starvation versus salicylates. Whenever you have an increased anion gap metabolic acidosis, there's a basic workup that needs to be done. Obtain serum ketones to rule out DKA, salicylate levels, as well as serum tox screens to rule out toxins, CK level to rule out rhabdomyolysis. Note, whenever you have a primary disorder, the change in bicarbonate should equal the change in the pH. Now let's talk about normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. This is described by the mnemonic Durham and it represents diarrhea, ureteral diversion, renal tubular acidosis, hyperalimentation or overeating, Addison's disease or ammonium, as well as miscellaneous including amphotericin B and toluene. It is important to note the difference between normal and elevated anion gap acidosis. It is important to tease out the cause of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. We can do this by urine anion gap. Urine sodium plus urine potassium, the sum of that minus urine chloride, helps identify an RTA. If it's greater than zero, then you have a type 1 or type 4 RTA, renal tubular acidosis. If it's less than zero, then look for another cause of the Durham causes, such as GI losses is a possible cause. Now, I said before that if there's a primary disorder, the change in bicarbonate should equal the change in pH, which is true. But sometimes we have mixed disorders, where there's, two, there's an acidic disorder and a basic disorder in the same patient. So we use what's called Winter's formula for metabolic acidosis to tell whether a second disorder is present. What this does is we use the normal serum, bi or the serum bicarb that's been recorded, multiply it by 1.5, add 8, and then add 2 or subtract 2 to give us a range. That formula will give you a predicted PCO2. If the predicted PCO2 is not close to the actual recorded PCO2, then you know a second disorder is present. In addition, it's important to calculate the osmolar gap. Osmolar gap is, is 2 times the sodium plus BUN divided by 2.8 plus glucose divided by 18. If this is greater than 10 from the actual serum osmolality, then you know there's some active substances within the bloodstream. So two important formulas that you need to commit to memory because they'll help you identify acid-based disorders. Next, let's talk about metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis is when there is an increase in serum bicarbonate reflected by an alkalotic pH, so pH greater than 7.45. The causes are, one, vomiting, slash NG suction, two, hypermineral corticoid states, three, overdiuresis. So for metabolic alkalosis, we can tease out the etiologies of the many etiologies by using urine chloride. If you get a UA and measure urine chloride within the UA, you'll note that if the urine chloride is less than 10, then the metabolic alkalosis is likely due to vomit depletion, such as NG suction, that's nasogastric tube suction, vomiting, or diuresis. If urine chloride less than 10, is greater than 10, then licorice ingestion, hypomagnesemia, or barter syndrome could be a cause. To identify if there's a secondary acid-based disorder, if the primary is metabolic alkalosis, we use this basic formula. The PCO2 rises by 0.5 to 1 for each unit increase in bicarb, from 24, then we know there's only one disorder. If it does not, that means there's a second disorder present. So let's talk about respiratory acidosis. In respiratory acidosis, the pH is less than 7.35, and the primary defect is an increase in the PCO2. This is developed due to hypoventilation. So here are the causes of hypoventilation. Anything that affects the chest cavity, central respiratory drive, or the lungs. The diseases that affect the chest cavity are neurological disorders such as Lou Gehrig's disease, pleural fusions, pneumothorax slash filled chest. Things that affect the central respiratory drive are sedation, narcotics, obstructive sleep apnea, 
and things that affect lungs are pneumonia, pulmonary edema, reactive airways, and tumors. Sedation and narcotics is really important to note because when you're in the hospital and patients are getting a lot of medications, a lot of times you'll see patients develop respiratory acidosis, especially if they're unable to adequately clear these medications. So it's always important to consider when you're evaluating a patient with respiratory acidosis. You can always give them Narcan if they're getting opioids and are developing respiratory acidosis and look distressed. To identify if there's a second acid-based disorder in respiratory acidosis, we need to first identify if they're in an acute situation or chronic situation. If there's an acute respiratory acidosis, then every PCO2 increased by 10, the bicarb should increase by 1. If it does not, then there's a second acid-based disorder present. For example, if bicarb is maybe 10 more than predicted, that would indicate a second disorder present. For chronic respiratory acidosis, every PCO2 increase of 10, bicarb should increase by 3 to 4. And again, if it does not match predicted, then we know there's a second acid-base disorder present. We are going to now talk about respiratory alkalosis. In respiratory alkalosis, the primary defect is a decrease in PCO2. The pH will be greater than 7.45. The reason we have an increase in PCO2 is that there's increased clearance of CO2 due to increased ventilation. The causes of increased ventilation in respiratory alkalosis include systemic, central, and lung causes. Quite a variety of causes here, including sepsis, salicylates, liver failure, congestive heart failure. Central causes include ischemia, infarction, CNS tumors, anxiety, pain, fever. Lung slash airway causes include PE, restrictive lung disease, bronchospasm, and pneumonia. There's a, a lot of causes for respiratory alkalosis, and it really depends on the patient's history and presentation to be able to tease out the exact etiology of a respiratory alkalosis. No, sepsis and salicylates cause an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis and a respiratory alkalosis. To identify if there's a secondary disorder, again, use these formulas that I listed below in both an acute and chronic respiratory alkalosis settings. But the most important thing to note is that for respiratory alkalosis, it is the only single acid-based disorder where compensation can return the pH absolutely to normal. So watch out for this. We have just covered the basics of acid-base disorders. Here again are the basic steps to approach any acid-base disorder no matter how complicated. Always determine the pH. If it's acidotic or alkalotic, then look at the PCO2 and bicarb to determine the primary disorders. Then look to see if there's a secondary disorder. Remember to always calculate your anion gaps. Two, always correct for albumin. Three, if it's a non-elevated metabolic acidosis, look at your urine anion gap. If you have a metabolic alkalosis, look at your urine chloride. And basically, look at the history of the patient and the presentation of the patient to really tease out the condition that is causing their acid-base disorder. This is Reese from the medical school. If you really like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. Also, follow me on Twitter, iMedSchool, where I give a couple questions every day that may show up on your step one, two, and three.